because people put it into cows and sheep. So it was hard to just do a simple experiment, but we did know our lab has been studying TB, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the big bacteria I showed you several slides ago, that there are very well established mouse models for tuberculosis. So what we did, and I don't want to give you all the gory details, but I just want to give you the idea of the process of our work, is we asked, does not to matter when you make tuberculosis in a mouse? And what we found was the following. And again, I refer people who are interested in more details. This came out, uh, well, it's in the November 15th edition, so that's next week, but it's probably online now, uh, by a very talented postdoc, Maziar Divangagi, who left the lab to go to Boston and do more work on this. What he found is that the NOD2 protein, so this is the Crohn's gene, okay, the Crohn's susceptibility gene, it mediates what we call innate immunity to mycobacterial infection. What do I mean by innate immunity? If we take the cells out of the mouse and put them in a petri dish and we throw mycobacteria on them, if NOD2 is broken, it doesn't see the mycobacteria as well on the petri dish, okay? Or it mediates adaptive immunity. What do I mean by adaptive immunity? If we throw the mycobacteria into the mouse and then we ask it on day 28 what kind of immune response it mounts against mycobacteria, it was less. And how did that translate? We had this very kind of paradoxical result, which was that for the first few months after infection, the nod to knockout mice looked great. They ignored the mycobacteria, and they said, I'm not going to mount an immune response to you. You don't trouble me. I'm just going to be fine. And their lungs looked beautiful. They looked like they hadn't been infected. But they still had the infection. They hadn't mounted an immune response, and they hadn't cleared it. And later on, by six months after infection, we did two independent experiments. Then suddenly they had more bacteria and more pathology. So it was sort of like a see me now, see me later type of a trade-off. And so that gives us some, some data that says NOD2 seems to matter for a mycobacterial infection. Okay. So that takes us to unknown number three. So it matters for a mycobacterial infection. Dr. Baer, you said it senses this thing called MDP. And according to Google, MDP is in all bacteria. So why would I believe that this NOD2 mutation matters more for your bacteria than for any other bacteria? And that, of course, has to be established. <laughs> is there something about mycobacterial MDP? That's something we are currently pursuing because it turns out mycobacteria make a modified form. But whether that matters or not, that's something that requires further investigation. So we're at known unknown number three. And now the most pragmatic thing we heard from the probiotic discussion, should I go on drug A? Should I go on VSL3? Should I go on antimycobacterial therapy? If Crohn's is an infection, why not just give antibiotics, knock out the infection, and cure the disease? That would be the ideal. That's where we would like to see ourselves five, ten years from now. But there are a lot of issues with it. Which patients? What will it prevent? Will it prevent remission? Will it maintain remission or relapse? Uh, which antibiotics? Which doses? So we have to say, okay, well, what do we know about antibiotics for this infection? Well, you could go back to the cows, right? I told you we have facts. We know that this organism causes cows to become sick. So how do we treat cows with mycobacteria-impaired tuberculosis? We don't. Zero data on antibiotics in cows. Do you know what we do with a cow that has mycobacteria-impaired tuberculosis? We call it. This is not meant to be flippant or dismissive. This is a huge issue that the livestock industry wants to know. If these animals that are sick are posing a human risk, we need to know that. And they probably should not go into the abattoir. And if they do not cause a human disease, then it doesn't matter. But right now, they are stuck. They're waiting for research to indicate is this the appropriate course of action or not. In the meantime, though, I can tell you we don't know about antibiotics from cattle because we don't give antibiotics to cattle. So, what do we know about treating this? If you go to the lab, well, you can grow the bacteria, throw antibiotics on, and see if they work. And there's a little bit of data, but there's not a lot. And uh, most of it was published in 1991, so it's probably ready for an upgrade. And in animals, very little. And in humans, there's just one trial. And then you say, well, 
Okay, you gave antibiotics to people, but do we know it really killed this bug or <coughs> other bugs? It's really hard to work out. But I'm going to tell you about one trial. So Warwick Selby in Australia, with the support of Pfizer Pharmacia, uh, conducted a randomized clinical trial of over 200 patients with Crohn's disease that was published last year in the journal Gastroenterology. And they gave people two years. Okay, no, we're not talking about a week or two weeks. Two years of antibiotics and said, how did the antibiotic group do to compare it to the placebo group? They published that there was a 16% absolute benefit at 16 weeks, which they thought was somewhat disappointing because there was this feeling that antibiotics should be better than that. And they said there was no further benefit after 16 weeks if you looked at one year or two years after treatment. So to some that was like, okay, well, I guess it's not really good. But I just want to point out there is a little detail in this trial. They randomized people on day zero to go on antibiotics or no antibiotics. And what they published in their study is the antibiotic group had 67 people in remission after 16 weeks. The placebo group had 55 people in remission. And then they followed them over time and they said they seemed to kind of fall together. They did not randomize people at 16 weeks to go on drugs or not. They random them, randomized them at zero weeks to go on drugs or not. And if you look at it from that point of view, you actually have to recalculate their numbers, which is what we did. So we asked, okay, given that they randomized people at zero weeks, if you redraw it, you will see that at 16 weeks, there's the benefit exactly that they published. And that same benefit is seen at one year. And that same benefit is seen at two years. But then at three years, when the antibiotics were stopped, so they're on antibiotics for two years, then in the third year, when the antibiotics were stopped, the two groups came together again. So, they did not show that the effect um, got better over time, but the effect at four months actually persisted. If you were ahead at 16 weeks, you were ahead at one year, and you were ahead at two years. I think that's important to know, but nonetheless, you see that whether on placebo or on antibiotics, groups continue to fall out of remission so this is not a perfect cure. You'd like to think if antibiotics were really good, everybody would be in remission and everybody would stay in remission. So it wasn't perfect. Nonetheless, I think there's some proof of concept that really needs to be evaluated over time. So what do I believe the antibiotic trial taught us? I think the lessons are that the people on the drug group did a bit better than the people in the placebo group. I think that was a fact. But what it did not answer is it didn't tell us why the drug group did better than the placebo group. There could be other effects of these antibiotics. And unfortunately, one of the weaknesses of the mycobacterium peritoberculosis research community, of which I am a member, is we have not delivered good tests. We have not delivered assays to detect the organism that gastroenterologists like Dr. Opaliski can use. So without testing for the presence of it before treatment, and the presence for it after treatment, we can't actually assign why people got better. All we can say is people got better. So there's a very important distinction in my mind between do antibiotics make people better, perhaps, and do antibiotic trials find the cause of the disease. They don't do that. They're pragmatic trials that they, they're there to make people better. They don't ask the same scientific question, okay? So finally, no, 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 number four, I would say, which antibiotics were best? We don't really know. And of the antibiotics in that trial, one of them is not available in Canada unless you lobby, but it's something you can't get at Chopper's Drug Mart. We don't know how long, we don't know the dose. It hasn't been optimized the way <coughs> drug therapy is for other conditions. So at this point, if the people in the room say, should I be calling my doctor on Monday morning and saying I want to go on 24 months of antimicrobacterials, I would say maybe we should get a little more data about the drugs and how they work and how they could work, and hopefully there will be clinical trials to formally assign whether they work or not, because simply taking drugs for a long time, as we know, there can be adverse effects. So you have to really know that the, um, the benefits exceed the risk. And taking antibiotics like this, it may benefit you, but without a trial, it will be hard to know. Okay, so I would say the known knowns and the known unknowns. The known knowns are it makes cows sick, and it seems to be present in Crohn's tissue at the time 
that you analyze when somebody's already sick. 